I don't know where to go now. That's always, uh, always fascinates me how God communicates. It's, isn't it interesting how he does it? <laughs> All right, now I really don't know what to do. <laughs> that was hilarious, Dave. Um, huh. Well, I, uh, maybe we ought to pray ourselves in and then I'll do announcements. I know we have offering to do. Um, we need one other volunteer, unless you're volunteering, Rob. There you go. Um, let's pray real quick, though, before we get started. And let's, uh... <clears throat> Lord, thank you for family. Thank you that you move in our lives, that you speak to our hearts, that you very much, very much want us to understand and know you and, and accept that love and affection you have for us, Lord. I, I don't know what to say just in the moments you just gave us, um, that in itself was glorifying you. And I, I'm grateful for that moment. I know everyone else here is also. I, I just pray that whatever the needs are and uh, the spiritual conditions of those people in our lives, Lord, whatever's going on, uh, that you would give us great courage, just great determination. that we would clearly see what it is that you're doing or at least trust and believe in what you're doing, no matter how difficult it is. I pray that today, whatever we talk about, the message, Lord, that you would speak, um, that you would make it your own and that all of us would learn from your word and that it would make us more effective Again, we pray for those that don't know you. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to offer us opportunities to share the blessing of our salvation with others. I do pray for those that are not here right now. For whatever the reason, Lord, I pray that you would deal with it, that you would resolve it, uh, that um, they could come spend time with us as a family and see that we are a family. We ask that you would be glorified. Amen. A um, couple things were uh, things we need to work on. We now have some resources to work with, which means we now need to start thinking in terms of how to develop and grow the church. There have been some concerns brought up from some people, and I want to say this. Thank you very much for venting concerns to me. That's what I need to hear. I mean, I, it, it's not a negative if the idea is to make positive adjustments. One of the things I think we do need to do, and, and uh, we need to figure out how to do it. And don't expect me to do it by myself. I can't. I need help doing it. But we need to start either a home group or some home groups, especially for younger people yeah because and it, it's i i have to use you isn't it reason being and i found this in my life and those of you that are getting older find it in yours um it's hard to remember uh, that there's a whole different level of energy and growth that's occurring in those early stages of marriage those teen years, those 30 years, there's all of this development going on, and it's in my nature. I don't know about yours. Uh, I really would just rather go home and sit and watch TV and go to sleep and eat something that I like to eat. We get, we get comfortable. Um, more than one uh, has expressed a concern with me, uh, and I'm trying to be very careful how I say all this. If we do not, those of us that have resources and have the ability, if we do not invest them in the younger families and in the younger people in the church, uh, we are not doing our job. Uh, it's our job to do that. It is our job to build replacements. I've said this before. 
it's, it's very important that we are reaching out and building disciples, training up the next generation to take the job. Um, Wednesday night, Tim Pope's going to be teaching on prayer. Tim has been working very hard. Uh, we spent an, at least an hour, possibly even two hours on the phone as I drove back from St. Louis, just simply talking about what he wants to teach on Wednesday night. And it's going to be more than one time he's going to teach on it. But Tim Gross, Grossi, he's going to get involved in it now. That, to me, is exciting uh, for, because he's actually very well educated biblically. You see, that's the kind of stuff that has to start happening. We need to get more and more people involved in doing this ministry. You're needed. You're needed. Um, especially when it comes to, and, and please understand me on this, it's not about inviting people to church, and I've said it before, it's not about inviting people to church just to have another warm body. Your reason for inviting someone to church is the hope and the desire that God will bring them in and we can connect them with the family body and be a service to them. And that's pretty much what the sermon's going to be on today. Getting to the point that we understand that this is heavily about service. Um, I, was, I was driving in today and it came to me and it's probably something I heard from somebody else, but it popped in my head so I wrote it down in, as I was driving so it's real scribbly because it's hard to write and not look at what you're writing. But I can, I can read it. But catch this thought. And you, may, and you may get this from what we teach today, but I'm going to give it to you in advance. Some are serving in the church. Some want to serve in the church. But there's a whole other group that we have to deal with. And that is those that want to be served. See, there's a difference. There are those that are serving, those that want to serve, and then there are those that go to church simply to be served. That's not what church is for. And I'm going to show you scripturally. You were saved to serve. You're not saved to be served, even though you will be served. You're saved to serve. And, um, and I'm, I'm, my, my sermon's probably going to take in a whole other dynamic now. Thanks, Ashley. Um, please, please understand this. I'm not making this up. I'm not saying this for my own gain. It is a fact. If you choose to live your life to serve Christ, you will be blessed. If you choose to live your life for yourself, you will not be blessed the way you really want to be blessed. Satan brilliantly will try to convince you that what you think is right and what works for you is the right thing. That is not the way our Lord teaches us. He teaches us to serve. And we're going to look at it today because we're moving back into John. And we're going to be at John chapter 13. Not yet, Alan. We're going to bring up Exodus 6. Now, you're going to see why I brought up Exodus 6 when we get to John 13. But we need to start with Exodus 6. Oh, one more thing. You can go ahead and bring that up, Alan. If you would like to do a marriage conference at this church where we invite people in the community even for free, we will provide them the books but we can do a marriage conference here. Again, we have resources available where we can actually get the stuff and actually study together principles on marriage. And I learned from Gary Smalley that I don't care how old you are, how long you've been married, you always need to refresh your understanding of principles of marriage and how to have an effective marriage. Children. Teenagers should sit in on marriage conferences even though they're not married. It makes all the difference in the world to know what it is to be in a relationship with other people correctly, not just in marriage, but in society itself. If you're interested in being a part of that, 
you need to let me know. We need to get together and we need to start building it and we need to be able to take it into the community and make it available to people. Because I guarantee you in our community out here are a lot of people that wish somebody would teach them what it is and how it is to be married correctly. It's, it's the truth. So here we are in Exodus 6.6. 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgments. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of Egypt. Let's go a little further and see what's next. Is there any more? Maybe? I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses. Because, did you see it? Back up again real quick, Alan. Because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Stop there. And you'll see how this ties in. If, if you've ever done this, it's really fun. It's amazing. Again, it's one of the reasons why I believe the Word of God is really the Word of God. Look at Egypt as being the world. So God says, I will bring you out of slavery. I'll take you out of the world. See, back up. let's back up and just look at them again. And look at it as the world is Egypt. Back up to, what, Six. I will bring you out from under the burden of Egypt, of the world. And I will deliver you from slavery, meaning I'll free you from this bondage you're in. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will will save you. I will redeem you with acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. You will become my people. I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now jump to the, uh, the last ones I was looking at. Notice what, what they did. They didn't listen to what God said. You know why they didn't listen? Because of their burdens. Did you see it? Because of their burdens. Because of what's happening to them in the world. They didn't listen. See it? Because their broken spirit and harsh slavery... Because of sin, because of all the things that are going on, they're not listening. God just said, I will, repeatedly. And the problem is, Israel is saying, nah, we're just slaves. It's too, we can't. We don't believe you, Moses. It's amazing, the whole story, just very quickly. But you look at the Exodus, they get taken out of slavery. And God is now taking those people he freed from slavery. Think of yourself. And he's taking them to their promised land. But on the way, they have to go through the desert. That's life. It's, do you see it? Are, are you seeing the picture? But as they're going through the desert, he's got a cloud over them at nighttime and a pillar of, or uh, over the daytime and a pillar of fire at night, meaning he's caring for them, he's guiding them, he's helping them, he's feeding them. And they keep refusing to believe him. Are you with me? Have you looked at the story of the Exodus? And then they start complaining because it's not going the way they want it to go. So they go, we just might as well go back to Egypt. We can at least eat cucumbers and garlic. Let's just go back into the world because if we go back into the world, at least we were getting something we wanted. You see it? And then the next thing that happens is they get to the door. They have the opportunity to go into the promised land. And they won't go because it's too big. Giants out there are just too hard, too difficult. We can't do it. It won't happen. They give up. So God says, fine. You sit there in the desert for 40 years. You guys have decided to reject believing me. You go ahead and stay there. You'll die off. The next generation will go in. What's amazing, this is one of the saddest statements to me God makes. 
when they're talking about it all and complaining, God says, even when you were in the desert and you rebelled against me and you were in judgment, I at least kept shoes on your feet and fed you, kept you clothed. He said, literally, your God said to these people, you're, you're accusing me. Yet I still even took care of you even when you were in sin. Go read the Exodus account. It's amazing. Now, why did I bring up the Exodus account? We're going to go to John now. John 13, the Passover. The Passover. The meal of Sadar. It's spelled S-E-D-E-R. It sounds like S-A-D-E-R. There's four cups at that meal. I told Don I would tell her about the four cups. There's four cups at that meal. John chapter 13. We're going to talk about the cups a little bit. You call me teacher and Lord, you are right. No, go back to, go to the, go to, yeah, go back to 13.1. That's not on the paper you photographed. That's why you didn't have it. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Don't miss that. We're just going to walk through this piece by piece and try and build the puzzle. Notice that love is stated twice. It's doubled. So we have very clearly defined what's going on here. He now is, his hour has come. Loves his own, who are in the world. He loved them to the end. He loves you. Do, you. do you get that in the text? He loves you. During supper, meaning it's already started. They're eating the Passover. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, Simon's son, to betray him. In the scariot. Well, the next one. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Stay there for a minute. Don't move. Here you are at the Passover supper. They're all reclining. Jesus is sitting in the middle. He is the, the head guy, the most honored. Right next to him, just for a footnote, and I'll, I'll develop it maybe a little bit, on the next honored seat is Judas. Isn't that fascinating? And as it circles around, the lower you are in um, authority, the further out on the end of the circle you sit. So the children, if there were children, would have been to the far side of the circle. If you were the lowest slave in the home, the lowest of the lowest slaves, your job was to wash the feet of the guests. Do you see the crisis that's now taking place with these people? Jesus, who is the top guy, gets up, takes off his Nice, beautiful robe that he wore, which is actually an act of humiliation. You, if you're from this culture, you would never do that if you were a person of great prominence or authority. And then he wraps the towel around him and goes to wash their feet. And we'll look more at that in a second. So he came to Simon Peter who sat, said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, and be ready for this, Alan. I may make you go back on this stuff because you guys are going to see it for the first time maybe. If you've seen it before, I'm proud of you. The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. But it is complete. 
but is completely clean. Peter, and you are clean, but not every one of you. Now, look up and listen to me. Jesus just told him, you're clean. But I have to wash your feet. What do you think Jesus does with a Christian every day of their life? Ceremonial cleansing occurs. Let me give you a little more history, then I'll help you out maybe. There was a place where you bathed if you were at the temple, and you would bathe. You'd clean yourself. And the rest of the day, you didn't have to clean yourself. The only thing you had to bathe were your hands and your feet as you went through your day because you were already cleansed ceremonially. Jesus is telling Peter, you're already saved, but I have to wash your feet because your feet touch the ground when you walk on this planet. You sin every day. He cleanses your feet every day. You're saved But He cleans you. He cleanses you. He becomes a servant in reference to you personally. Do you see this about Jesus? You see it? I want you to catch more of this. It should give you chills. It gives me chills. Go to the next. For He knew who was to betray Him. That was why He said, not all of you are clean. You know He washed Judas' feet. Oh, what does that mean? What's the secret in that? I don't know. (laughs) But he did wash his feet. As you recall, earlier, I think it's in Luke somewhere. I know it's in Luke somewhere. I just can't remember where. Um, I don't even know if I wrote it down, Alan. I don't think I did. Do you remember when Jesus sent out the disciples, all 12 of them, and he gave them the ability to heal? Remember that? Even Judas the one who betrayed Christ and didn't believe. Just something for you to play with. I haven't figured it out yet. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. But back to the text. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his, out, put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Stay there. Now, I told you I'd tell you about the cups. You thought I forgot. I did. I think when Jesus got up to wash their feet, it was the third cup when he did it. Typical classic of Jesus. I'm not the only one that thinks that. Multiple people do. At this Passover meal, there's four cups, each one, and we read it in in, uh, Exodus 6. The first cup is, and I paraphrase it, made it very simple to understand. The first cup is a statement of, I will bring you out. The second cup is a statement, I will deliver you. The third cup in the Jewish practice is, I will redeem you. And the fourth cup is, make you my people. I think Jesus got up at the third cup. And now all of this ties into that that whole statement of redemption that started all the way back in what God said in Exodus 6. I will, I will, I will, I will, four times. That's why the Jewish people have those four cups because of the four I wills that God says back in Exodus 6, 6. Now, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. So what did he do when he washed their feet? What was he saying? Forgiveness, continual forgiveness. You're clean, but I have to wash your feet. I have to clean. Now, look at the statement. What are we supposed to do? And what does that mean? Forgive each other. Forgive each other. Do you know how many preachers miss that? (laughs) And when I saw it, I was like, I can't believe I've read this thing this many years and never caught it. Never caught it. So I went to challenge my thinking on it, looking at other commentators and stuff. 
It's very clear what he's saying there, isn't it? He says to Peter, Peter, you're clean, but I have to wash your feet. I have to continually forgive you until that day of full redemption. You're clean, but your feet are dirty. And then he says to us, now, you're right, I am the teacher. You're right, I am your Lord. So guess what, guys? You ought to wash one another's feet. It's always baffled me that there have been churches who have tried to make a big deal out of the feet washing thing, and they literally sit around and wash each other's feet. That is not what this is about. This is not what this is about. That's a ritual now when they do that stuff. This is about an attitude, not a ritual. This is an attitude. Do you see it? Wash one another's feet. Now, here's what you're going to find as we get going on this, because I will run out of time if I don't keep moving. Go to verse uh, 20. Let's go to 20. Are we there now yet? Let's keep going. There it is. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Do you see the unity there? After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. He's back to Judas again, and I'm going to move quickly, and here's why I have to move quickly. Chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 are very quick moving. Very much it's moving now. The story is taking its, its thrust. And everything that's said from chapter 13 to 16 is where Jesus gets to chapter 17 and prays about everything he said in 16, 15, 14, and 13. That's why I tell you chapter breaks actually mess up the flow of Scripture. You've got a flow of thought occurring, and I encourage you to go read all of 13, 14, 15, and 16 together, nonstop, all as one part, and then when you get to 17, you become very reverent in your thinking and read chapter 17. We're going to try and do that a little bit today. But don't take today and just go home and that's it. Or you will walk away missing one of the most profound, important statements made in your scripture in all of these chapters when you pull them all together. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown. I've got to jump through because we don't have enough time to read that many chapters. Go to verse 34. And I'll get back to Judas here in a second. Go to 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. What did we see at the first part of John 13? Where he said twice. Remember? Love. Are we back to love again? What's the new commandment? What did he do when he washed their feet? And what did he tell us to do? And what are we supposed to do? You're doing good. Thanks, Donna. Do you see it? But I, I'm, that's just starting. I, now, this is Jesus, not me. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. What's Judas doing? We talked about it last week. Remember when the perfume bottle got broken and they put it on the feet of Jesus? And what did Judas say? What are you doing? We could have had that money. And what was Judas doing with the money that he was keeping for the... Yeah. Yeah, he was stealing it. It was all about himself. Why do you think Jesus keeps bringing up Judas? What is Jesus doing to Judas? He washed his feet. Right? He gave him the ability to do miraculous things. But Judas is still rejecting, rejecting him as Lord and Messiah, is he not? You know why Judas is rejecting that? Because his relationship with Christ is about himself. It isn't about serving Christ. Do you see that? It's there. Go look at it. We've been looking at John. What is John? And Rob said it one day real well. He said it very... We've been looking at the difference between thinking in the world and thinking spiritually. The world will always tell you it's about you and what you need and what you want. Scripture will always tell you, no, it's not. It's about Christ being glorified by you serving His cause, His purposes, His will, 
his wants, his desires. So he gets up and he takes and wraps that thing and washes the feet of all those people in that room. Peter, I don't blame Peter for jumping and going, what are you doing? What is, what is, I mean, why wouldn't you? But do you see, do you see the reversal in thinking? What's your scripture say? He who wants to be first should be last. You remember when they argued over who was going to be greater in the kingdom? Do you know that happens just before these texts that we're in now? I mean, I can just see Jesus saying to God, is there another 12 out there maybe I could have? But think about it for a minute. And this is one of the things I love about Jesus. Every one of us in this room, every one of us, me included, do we or do we not struggle with selfish, self-centered, self-focused thinking all the time? All the time. But look at Jesus. And this, I, we've said it before, but it just, it's the most baffling thing to me. It's the reason why I'm a Christian, one of the big reasons. Here you are in perfect environment in heaven. Perfect environment. You are worshipped every single hour of the day. You are seen as glorious. You are projected as glorious, meaning all those angels in heaven that are seeing Jesus are going, oh my. And all of a sudden, one day you're a little baby and you're pooping your pants and peeing on yourself and puking and your mom and dad have to raise you and you're growing up around all these people just like they are and all of a sudden, there you are you're the king, and you have made yourself that low? That is a baffling thought. You have not only become a human being to save me, but you're now going to allow yourself to be humiliated for me. So if I'm supposed to be like Christ, and he diminished as much as he did for my sake, and then he died for my sake. What should my thinking be? Really and truly, it's hard to do, everybody, because we're humans. What should my thinking be? If that's the example, then, Lord, humiliate me. Do you see that? Humiliate me. Take me down as far as you have to take me for whoever, for whatever purpose, as long as it glorifies your name. Now you tell me. I don't know how good I'm going to do that. <laughs> that is a lot to ask, isn't it? How many of you would be comfortable washing my feet? Listen, I've seen some pearly, pretty gnarly feet. I wouldn't be comfortable washing anybody's feet. And I'm not saying that's what he's saying. I'm saying that he became the lowest of the lowest for the purpose of all. You know what a church is designed to do? We are to serve each other. By serving each other, we are serving Christ. Did you know that? It's pretty simple in, this, in, its, in its statement. Now, actually doing it's another thing. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Now, go to chapter 14, 12 through 21. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. So, don't miss this. The level of your belief determines how willing you are to serve. Doesn't mean you aren't clean. Doesn't mean you aren't saved. But the level that you're willing to go to work, to do what Jesus did, is how well you believe what he said. What happened at the Exodus? They didn't believe, did they? They wouldn't listen to Moses, would they? And God's telling him, I'm going to save you from all of this. Amazingly enough, what happens when you don't believe? You suffer loss, Dan. Yeah, you suffer loss. You suffer loss. You miss out on his blessing. You miss out on what he is taking you to. He's taking you to where you need to be. Look at the rest. And greater works than these will 
he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let me help those of you who have sat underneath the prosperity teachers. That is not talking about your selfish desires being met. That's not talking about you getting a new car or a new house or more money or a better wife or whatever. That is not talking about that at all. Zero. That is saying anything you ask that is in accord to me, according to who I am, according to the plan and the message of the gospel, anything you ask that is to serve the cause of Christ, I will do that. I will serve that request. Now, if you're walking with your Lord well enough, your life should be following that pattern of thinking, Lord, I'm asking for this change in my life so I can be a greater blessing to you and a greater service to you. I am asking you, Lord, to equip me to glorify your name. I'm asking, for, if you ask for a car, you better be asking for it for the purpose of glorifying the name of Christ. If you're asking for more money, you better be asking for the purpose of bringing things in line in your life to where you are serving and worshiping your Lord. That is what that's talking about. Please do not listen to these people who tell you if you name it and claim it, God will give it to you. That is not true. You are a servant of a living God. You are a servant. And our job is to serve. And from that service, you were blessed. He's not a genie in a bottle. And quite frankly, if you're honest with yourselves, have you ever seen him do any genie-like things, really? I mean, I have not gotten all the requests I've asked for. If he's a genie in the bottle, he's not a very good genie. I mean, think about it. But every time I've wanted spiritual blessing, it comes. What else is there? And Jesus is going to say it. We're going to read it. Eternity is knowing God. That's eternity. Blessing is knowing God. Knowing God. Not getting from God. Knowing God. Loving God. Intimacy with God. That's that word there. Depth. More than just let's play church games. More than give me a better life. No, Lord, don't give me a better life. Give me a better relationship with you. Give me the ability to be in whatever swamp you want me to be in and rejoice. Give me that. Give me that. And we don't understand. And I would, if Jesus were here, I mean, even if you guys weren't here, I'd be looking at him going, would you please keep helping me understand this? Because I'm not getting it yet. I'm not getting it yet. And you can see it when you go read these chapters. You're going to see they aren't either. We're no different. They aren't either. But we need to get it. If you will love me, you will keep my commandments. And there he goes again. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Do you see the intimacy again. See, this is not about religion. This is about relationship. This is about understanding who you are, who God is, what Jesus did, what God's purpose is. Is this convicting yet? Just a little. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live and you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father. My goodness. And you are in me. And I in you. Why is that so hard to believe? Why is it so difficult to understand the level of intimacy that exists between us and God? You know why? Because we think of ourselves as individuals instead of as a unit. This is a unit. A church is a body of believers that he wove together as a body. Hands, feet, eyes. You've seen the text where it talks about it. Paul talks about it. 
And when that church understands that they are a part of the living trinity, you have the Holy Spirit in you? Do you have Jesus in you? Is God your father? There you are. You're in the family. You're family. It's family. It's one. You're not going to divide it. Why did Jesus say, you're not, you know, God, they can't be snatched out of my hands? All of those statements all through your scripture, all over the place, all the time. Unity. Unity. Oneness. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Stop there for a second. Multitudes of pastors have read this to guilt you. I'm not trying to guilt you. The commandments we're talking about, it's very simple, guys. It's very simple. You've been hearing him say it over and over again. You want to keep the commandments of God. How do you keep the commandments of God? I've said it before. How do you keep God's commandments? Do you keep God's commandments by trying to keep God's commandments? Have you ever seen anybody keep the Ten Commandments? No. The answer is no. Nobody has except Jesus. But what were the two great commandments? Oh, there it is. There's that love word again, isn't it? Oh, interesting. So if I have an attitude of service towards all of you and my Lord, am I keeping commandments? Am I keeping more than if I'm thinking of myself? You all are too quiet. Think about that. Think about it for a minute. There isn't a single human being on this planet in the right mind frame that would say there's anything higher than love itself. Even non-believers know that. So now take it into the arena of your God and creator and what he's asking of us as believers. I need to be totally made uncomfortable by each and every one of you. You need to make me miserable. Now, you know what I mean by that? I need to be willing to serve no matter what it's costing me. Why? Look how much it costs Jesus to serve you. I mean, doesn't that? It does me. Come on. It, I should be willing to go, you know, another phone call. I guess I got to take it. It's one of my family members. Even though I'm asleep. Or, well, how much do you need? If you need me to help you, I'll help you. I'll help you as best I can. I'll try. I'm going to help you. Why? Because you're my family. I can't believe how much money my wife has given away to our kids. That's another thing. Okay. All right, take me, and we still got time because we did things short today. Take me to 1422. I want you to see this. Judas, right? Not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it? that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world. Again, do you see the problem in Judas's thinking? It's worldly. It's always the issue in our thinking. It's all the things that we think are important here on this planet that really are not that important, even though they have value. It's not that important, though. Oh, you're jumping to that one. Oh, you're good. Except I want you to go to chapter 15. <laughs> 7 through 8. <laughs> Ooh, there he is. Catch it again. If you abide in me, is that an intimacy statement? If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. I'm going to give you a great secret here. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Are you beginning to see that, hmm, if I ask it, and it's according to his will, it'll be given. So the secret here is, is if I really want the things out of life that I really was designed and created to have, to enjoy my relationship with my father, it would be wise for me to start asking for things he would have me ask for. And if I do that, then more things are going to be given to me that I'm asking for. Which means the opposite would be if I ask for me, and I'm not asking for the glorification of his name through my life, then the odds are it's not going to bring me joy. I hate it when God gives me things I want, and then I get them, and then I go, man, I really didn't want this. Have you ever had that happen? Mm -hmm. 
Here we go again. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You need to go meditate on that. Look at this repetitiveness. These things I have spoken to you that you, that what? That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Well, here's how we deal with it. I don't believe you, Jesus. I think you're lying there. I cannot be happy and have joy doing it your way. I still have to keep the world involved in my life heavy enough that, no, Lord, I'm just not going to believe that's true. Instead, I'm going to try and figure out how to make more money, have a bigger house, nicer car, better family. I'm going to work on better church, better programs, better this, better that, better this, better He says nothing about that. Do you see the connection? Please don't miss it. You will find your joy in serving Christ. That's where it's at. You know what amazes me? And I know this is happening. There'll be people out there in the audience who will be convicted by what I'm saying. They'll actually think that I am preaching to them when in truth it's God speaking to us, me included. And they'll do one or two things with me. They'll ignore me because they think I'm bawling them out and I'm not bawling anybody out other than me. You just get to hear me yell at me. It's true. Or like in Exodus 6, when Moses told them, don't miss it. And Moses said, they're not listening. They're not listening to you, God. They don't want to hear what I have to say. You know why they didn't want to hear what Moses had to say? Because they just weren't quite convinced that getting out of of Egypt to slaves was the way to go. They didn't quite believe that Moses was telling them the truth. Go look at it. Go read all of Exodus. Look at it. I'm nobody, but I am telling you the truth. I am telling you what God says to us. You're reading it. I'm nobody. This convicts me as much as it does anyone else. This is my commandments that you love one another. Oh, there it is again. As I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, what did he just tell us earlier that we should do? We should lay our lives down for each other. We should literally serve each other. We should have a servant's heart. Again, if you struggle with selfishness in your life, this is your freedom. This is your way out. This is your way to actually get what you really want out of life, unless you don't believe me. And that's okay. I can't do anything about that. Let me give you some more and we'll start wrapping up. Uh, we need to go to 15. We did 9-11. We need to go 12 to 17. Keep going. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. There we go. We transition into the family. We're in the family now. We're fr- For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. He has made it very clear to each one of us as believers what he requires of us. I'm just very simple. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Oh, wait a minute. There's a word for us. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask, the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Appointed. Oh, he chose us. He appointed us. We're supposed to be bearing fruit. Remember me saying to you that if you are a Christian, you have a spiritual gift. If you're not using that spiritual gift, you really are in sin. It's that simple. You're in sin. And there it is again. Whatever you ask. The Father, in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, is it, a, is it a request? Is it an option? It's a command. So that you will love one another. 
Again, there we are. My goodness. This lovey-dovey stuff is too much for me. There must be something there of great wisdom. Go to chapter 16. 13 through 15. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. What did he just tell you? Everything that belongs to God, the Father and God, the Son belongs to you. Again, he's reaffirming to you that if you're on the same page with God and I, if you're on the same page with what we're doing, anything you ask according to my name, it will be done. See, if you move into the arena of thinking more spiritual in your life instead of worldly, and you start thinking in terms of what would God really do here? What is he asking me to do while I'm on this planet? It will be done. Do you don't see the power in that? Strong statements. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Winning the lottery doesn't do this for you. Just so you all know. Getting a big truck with big old tires on it isn't going to do that for you. It's just not. It won't. What else did I have here? 1633. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Where's your peace come from? In the world you will have tribulation. Oh, there's the world again. And it's wonderful tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. I guess I should take heart. What do you think? I think I probably have said enough to you. Go to John 17. And this is what we're going to end with. Now, everything that Jesus said from chapter 13 all the way up to 16, he is now going to pray. Remember, he said anything you ask, right? Now, Jesus is going to ask of the Father to fulfill everything he said from chapter 16 back to 13. So now let's look at it. These are the words of your Lord. So I hope you're going to be a little reverent here because now you are standing in a holy place. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. 
and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you in these things I speak in the world, that they may have, they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves, not individually, together, a group. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth, as you sent me into the world. So I have also sent them. Did you see it? Did you catch that? Are you going into the world? Hard question for me. Are you trying to build disciples and make disciples? Are you sharing Christ with the lost? Are you encouraging the saints with your life? Are you doing what the church has been instructed to do? Or are you just listening but not responding? That was the conviction I got when I read it. I mean, what are you actually doing? What are we doing? Are we like Judas, complaining and griping about the things not going the way we want them to go? Are we actually serving, doing something, doing something? Because from doing, serving, your joy is manifested. I didn't say it. I'm just saying what God says. If you've got a problem, you can yell at him. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only. You ready? Here we are, kids. But also for those who will believe in me through the word, meaning us, not just the guys there. He's saying you guys that are coming late. He's talking to you specifically right now. Isn't that great? I thought it was. That they may all be one just as your father just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe. Oh, wait a minute. Do you see that? Wait a minute. So let me get this straight. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So wait a minute, if I, if I get that, right, then I'm going to have an effect on the world, right? Because they're going to start seeing it manifested in us, which will allow them to start believing. They're going to look at a church that's got its, its head in the right place, and they're going to say, well, that isn't religion, and that isn't a denomination I see there. That's actually a group of people that love each other, And they love their God. It's pretty obvious they love their God. They get excited when they talk about God. And they get excited when they see each other. And all they're telling me is that I'm forgiven. And they're telling me that they can... Wait a minute. They're inviting me into their family now. Well, what's that? I've never... Most churches tell me I'm no good and stinky and smelly and don't come. But they're actually asking me to come in. Wait a minute. They're introducing me to God, the Father, and God, the Son... And wow, they're actually emulating Christ. And I think I may want this. Do you see the difference? Instead of just trying to put somebody in a seat on Sunday or trying to figure out how to grow a church, that's a waste of time. That's worldly thinking. The way we need to be thinking is about, am I loving my people that are my family? Am I loving my Lord enough to follow his commandments? Am I serving My family, my church family, am I serving my Lord by serving my family? Through that, the world goes, oh, now that makes sense. Because it's a universal language, isn't it? Is not love universal? Are you all still there? 
Should my focus be on everything else? If I haven't mastered the art of loving, if I'm not mastering that and making that my highest goal, I don't care how much money I have or how many programs I put into place. It's not going to do anything for the cause of Christ. It's just not. It's just a bunch of stuff. But to actually be glorifying Christ through our church and through our relationship, that is a gold mine. I hope you see that. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Did you see it? The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Tim Pope's going to talk a little more about that on Wednesday night. That they may be one even as we are one. Bye, Ashley. <laughs> I know you got to go. I and them and you and me. Is, is this true stuff? I mean, Jesus said it. Look, I in them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. What level of intimacy is that? O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you. We're these, by the way. These know you, that you have sent me. I made known to them your name. I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Oh, he's in us. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world has not known you, I know you. That's good. My encouragement to you, there is actually an encouragement here. My encouragement to you, take everything you think you know, everything you think you know about family, Raising kids, being married, doing church, raising money, making money, anything you want to pull that the world has. Take all of that stuff that you think you know and understand. Force yourself to put it on a shelf and go sit there at the feet of Jesus like we're supposed to do and say, what is it that you want me to actually know and understand? What is it that I need to know and understand? How is it, Lord, that I can step in this arena with you and do what you're doing? I mean, think about it. You know what's hard? Is most of us are going to leave here and go to lunch and then go home and take a nap and think about what we've got to do tomorrow and pay some bills and go back to work and forget all about the fact that your whole life is about glorifying his name. You're going to try and figure out how to build your little empire, make enough money to retire, Get enough job stuff going so you can have insurance and a nice car and a nice home. You want your kids to be the best educated kids you can get. You want them to play the best sports. You want them. And, you know, when you get to be 55 or, you know, like my dad's age, he's 78. I just told him how old you are. You start looking at this stuff and you start saying to yourself, there's got to be more to life than this. Yet it's amazing how many of us spend the bulk of our time building things in the world and it's going to go away anyway. Whereas eternal life is knowing the Father. I mean, I, I beg him. You should too. I beg him. Give me more. I want more. I really want more. I, I know some of you like me are tired of the world. Are you tired of the world yet? Some of you, some of you still think it's got something to offer you. You'll figure it out like we did. It doesn't really have much to offer. It just, it's all a lie. You might get a few bells and whistles out of it, but the truth of the matter is there's nothing more important. And if you don't believe me, be brave and come with me to the jails. Be brave and come to me to the funeral homes. Be brave, come to me and hold the hand of a dying person. All of these things that you think are so important are not important like you think they are. They're not. They're hay and straw and stubble. The gold and the silver is the relationship you have with Christ. It changes everything.
It really does. I hope you all agree. I hope you're not mad at me. And, you know, like Jesus said to his disciples, are you going to leave me too? <laughs> you guys, I mean, it's great. We're right there at the door. Right there at the door. So we're going to, please, and I'll wrap up in prayer. Please talk to me. Please tell me what it is that's your angst. Please tell me what's bothering you. Please tell me. Please at least let me into your life enough to where I can at least say something. Please. That's what the church is about. Not just me. You guys need to talk to each other too. You need to look at each other and go, hey, you stink. I mean, you need to be able to talk. You're a family. I mean, don't families stink? How many of you have had kids? You've got to know. Steve, you're changing diapers now. I mean, come on. People, people need to understand that. Look, I'm not more righteous, and you're not more righteous than me either. But we definitely need each other. We definitely need to talk to each other. We definitely need to take care of each other. Let's start doing more of that. I want, I want to do family groups. I want to do home groups. I want to do marriage groups. I want to do whatever we can do to where we can enjoy whatever aspect that God has in store for us. I want to have fun living out my Christian faith with a bunch of deviants. Yeah, you're the deviants. Okay? I've said enough. Oh my goodness. I didn't look at the clock. Let's pray. Oh, we didn't do offering, did we? We did. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Lord, thanks, thank you so very much. Thank you so much for the fact that this is beyond a religious activity, that this is, this is not about us playing games or anything. It's simply about you being our father, about your son and what he did for us, that we are family. Thank you for the fact that you have pulled us in so tight to you that you say we are one. Lord, I'm, I'm beyond words in saying grateful. I'm just grateful as best I can be. Lord, keep teaching us. Keep molding and shaping us. Teach us to surrender all like you did. Teach us to be ones that serve with an intention, with a plan, with a mission, with a goal. Teach us to be self-sacrificing. Teach us to love as you loved. Thank you for the families you've given us, the blessings in our life. And again, Lord, as always, we pray for those that don't know you. Give us great courage in sharing Christ in the community, not for growing our church, but for glorifying your name. And we ask this in obedience. Amen. Thanks, everybody. I'll go home and let God beat me up some more, and I'll...